All right. So the same disclaimer applies if you listen to the other two videos in this little series. Uh, but if you haven't, you're just stumbling on this one. My disclaimer is that this is not uh, one of my typical data instruction videos. I am not pitching this to a general audience. I am not claiming there's anything valuable to be learned here. I am just talking about my personal experiences and I'm uh, reading, verbalizing the content from my blog posts on the topic. Um, so this is from my website, ryanwomack.com. There's a little blog there without too many regular postings, but when I have something that happens that I want to talk about, I put a blog post up. Um, I have a couple of other ideas that I really need to get to. Um, so hopefully there'll be a little bit more before the end of summer 2024 when I'm recording this. Um, as I mentioned, there were two other verbal uh, versions of these posts. Uh, the two posts about my traumatic experience and recovery of having my websites go down and then having to rethink my approach in summer 2023. Uh, then the third one, which I call the Inshittification of Gandhi, or more first forced diversification, is actually, in a sense, more of the same, right? It was another service that let me down and I had to react by sort of rethinking my approach to working with this technology. Um, and you can see from the tags applied that I looked at a bunch of different services. If this really, if this is not the kind of thing that interests you, um, it's not going to suddenly turn around when <laughs> in the middle of this video. Um, but if you're listening, you know, let me just get into it. So the concept of inshittification, you might have heard about that um, as a kind of buzzword. Um, and there's a link to um, one of the articles that kind of popularized this term. I'm just going to clean up my extra windows here. Um, and the idea is that the um, internet economy is all about having capital flow in, build up a service to a critical mass, and then once you're there, your customers are sort of guaranteed by network effects. And so then you bleed the service out by cutting costs, reducing its functionality, sell, you know, sending more ads to people, um, and the quality goes down. And you make the company makes more money and the service is inshittified. Uh, so, in the words of the blog post, inshittification has rapidly become enshrined as a fundamental principle of the economy of the internet. Once customers are hooked on various free and enhanced services funded by excess capital, the screws are turned and customers are bled as the service is monetized by reducing costs and quality. Now that it's happened to me, it's become personal. I was a Gandhi customer for over 20 years. And here we go. Um, since my first ventures onto the internet with web hosting, still discoverable via the Wayback Machine, although I won't give any further clues than that, I was attracted to Gandhi by the no bullshit slogan, which seemed to match their attitude, their Frenchness, and their support for the open internet. I even got sent a free t-shirt by them for my 20 years of loyalty. That was nice, but in retrospect, it may have been a signal of the beginning of the end. I don't intend to provide a blow-by-blow -blow here of Gandhi's history, although one can do that via the discussion and links at Tech Rights and reading reviews on Trustpilot, and I provided some links for those. So, you can take a look at some perhaps uh, more extreme expressions of opinion. But suffice it to say that after an initial sale to private equity in 2019, Gandhi fell into the clutches of total web hosting in 2023. Around the time, again, summer 2023, I was saying, oh, Gandhi is great. Um, but this change started an express inshittification program of the service. 
Gandhi, which had always provided free email accounts to users with domain registration. First, that was five. Uh, later, it was cut to two. Now began to charge $4 a month, or $3.99 actually, for each email address. Right, So I had been a longtime Gandhi user for all of my you know, domain registration and was therefore provided with a bunch of free emails. My free my email strategy fueled by those very same free Gandhi accounts had been to run several addresses on each of my domains to segregate out emails by purpose. So online shopping different than personal communication um, in various different areas. And that would have been for me something like, um, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, right? Uh, at least two hundred, three hundred dollars a year for for email um, under their new strategy. Even for one mailbox, forty eight dollars a year, which would be the cost for one e email box, is an outrageously high fee because their email does not include encryption or any kind of add-on features at all. It's just basic email. Now, if they um, said, you know, a dollar a month or something, there, there would have been some level where they could have sold it and people who didn't want the inconvenience of switching would have swallowed the unpleasant medicine and maybe um, been okay with that or given them a pass. But the way Gandhi did this was quite nasty. Uh, this co cost was imposed universally, not at renewal time, right? So people who had free email addresses who had renewed for, you know, multiple years, up to 10 years you can renew for, um, and I was in that situation of having domains that stretched far into the future. Um, and instead of asking, you know, when you renew that, you're going to have to up for the new charge, what you already thought you'd paid for was snatched away. So that if you read about it, you'll see a lot of people believe that's not even legal under European law. But um, even without that, when a company be be behaves in a way that betrays your trust, you know, it kind of breaks things forever <laughs> and you have to run away. Um, so the whole thing was a giant insult to the customer. When someone says, sorry, sucker, to me, <laughs> uh, I'm going to take action. Um, so after I figured out that keeping Gandhi as my email provider was going to be impossible, I set about a, on the long path of removing Gandhi from my life. Um, so as I mentioned in the previous blog posts, I learned all about the benefits of diversification for disaster recovery and general resilience. So I decided to implement that now by separating out all of my functions and using multiple different providers, domain registration separate from DNS, separate from email, separate from web hosting, all handled separately, minimizing my dependency on any one link in the chain. And for each of those four areas, I have two or more different providers of the services so that if one of them has an issue, I already know how to set things up in another one. I've got an active account. I can switch things. Um, and the rest of this post is really about a lot of the specifics of that. So ironically, in my last blog post, I had praised Gandhi for being an island of stability in all of the sea of technological change. But little did I know that they had been hatching these plans to overthrow my email and cause me to leave them as well. So in the other posts, I talk about Versal and Render as good options for static website hosting with a little bit of digital ocean thrown in. Um, knowing about the other services mentioned there, Surge, Netlify, GitHub Pages um, that could be used if needed was also comforting. And so the website part was already taken care of by my early crisis with AWS. So. I worked backwards in the chain. I really needed to take care of the email first. So the next part is about me finding email providers. Uh, then there's the DNS providers. And then there's the domain name registration. Right. So the immediate task in front of me was to migrate email from Gandhi. 
I had been a long time paying user of Tutanota, which is now rebranded to Tuta, um, and um, new domains are tuta.com, not tutanota.com. Um, and that name change has gradually filtered in, filtered through to everything. Um, and I've been a free user of ProtonMail. So, you know, you're probably familiar with these if you're interested in encrypted email at all. I think those are the two largest players. Um, and both of the services are great on encryption and privacy. Um, I had already been using the custom domain feature of Tuta for one of my domain emails which is one of the main benefits of paying for their service. And so I decided to do the same thing with ProtonMail and start paying for it to link to another domain email. I consider both of these to be trustworthy and reasonably, reasonably priced mail services, and I sincerely hope they remain that way. Uh, the encryption aspect makes these services slightly harder to work with. Really, that's a getting to be a smaller and smaller um, issue as time goes on because of the functionality of all their apps across various platforms. The apps and the intriguing ProtonMail bridge feature which lets you use ProtonMail with any other email client and maintain encryption uh, are making using them increasingly easy and seamless. Um, and you know those services cost no more or, or even less than the outrageous uh, Gandhi <laughs> uh, feature free email. Um, so for other lightweight emails that are not quite throwaway emails, not something I would use, you know, Gmail or something horrifying like that for, uh, but they're not quite heavy, serious usage emails either. Um, as I mentioned, I had this strategy of just kind of like, I want my shopping email to be kind of something I, I just throw it out there. If someone needs me to sign up on a site, I can throw that out there without spreading my emails that I actually use for important communications um, too widely. Um, so I needed something that would provide several emails cheaply but without being free. So I do believe that if something is free then I become the product, right? I'm not going to be using Gmail. Um, and so I want to pay for something reasonable to ensure that the surface is, service is for me, not about me. I discovered and, and there are many uh, services that do that. I'm not claiming, again, special knowledge here, but I discovered Postal.io, which has a premium tier that's only $5 a month. It allows unlimited domains and up to 25 mailboxes. It's not an encrypted email service, but it is a very solid, classic, uh, old-school style email service. So that was enough for me to meet all my remaining needs at the same cost, basically, as a Gandhi single so-called email address would. Uh, Postile had a nice simple interface. It was relatively easy to use uh, using IMAP to set, sync up my local email archives and ingest them into the new service. Um, I did lose a little bit of stuff uh, in my migration because of my own error at one point. So, so I would caution people to take a little bit of care. Um, essentially, I thought that a mailbox was syncing when it wasn't, and I didn't double check before deleting the old emails. So, um, however, it was that was my fault. It was a positive experience. After a short transition, my new email now works seamlessly. Uh, there were other contenders that also seemed fine. I won't list them here, but I didn't need to go further than Postal. So I completed my email migration before Gandhi's November deadline when they were going to start charging for the uh, the new service, new email service. I paused a bit to rest. Um, this whole process, I was reading a lot about Gandhi, who I had just unwittingly unconsciously relied on for many years but now I knew about all the complaints and I knew that their support was non-existent now uh, so you know from a customer service point of view it was clear to me that the company was circling the drain and I needed to finish my exit from their services so although Gandhi was very convenient 
to register domains with. Um, bundling domain names in DNS, I needed to break this dependence. So for DNS, I set up uh, accounts with easy DNS, name cheap, DNS simple or DN simple. It's hard to know how to pronounce that. Um, and the intriguing uh, DSEC project. So um, I will say a little bit more about these than is in the post simply because I'm opening up those tabs. Um, easy DNS, I would call like a kind of standard commercial type service. Um, it has a detailed slash fussy kind of um, management interface. Uh, name cheap is literally cheap and a little bit more basic, but very widespread, popular. Um, DN simple is um, really quite uh, simple, as they say, but um, easy to manage things. And then the DSEC project is actually a a free service, right? That is is sort of like a public service version of DNS uh, that has a lot of interesting features. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I really like to see, um, like to see everything open, free, managed according to standards, managed not for profitability. Of course, since it's free, you always wonder, um, are they going to survive um, in the long term? If they have, a, you know, ways to seek support you know that's the kind of thing i'd be happy to support actually i wasn't sure about using it first you know a few months ago but everything is working fine with that um i can report so how to choose among these services is a bit hard for me to explain i was looking for something uh inexpensive easy to navigate and capable um but once you start learning about the issues around DNS, you develop a desire to pay for some level of assurance. No one service seems like an answer to all DNS problems, um, but I hope that exposure to this mixture of services will help me learn more over time. Easy DNS's $20 a year cost is very reasonable for one domain that is important to me. But if I needed to just sort of um, get a parked domain, you know, cover a misspelling or something, you know, twenty dollars a year for every single combo that I'd like to use that for starts to be maybe it's not so cheap. Um, Namecheap is less expensive, um, and DNS Simple is even more so. DNS Simple um, is only charging me, I think, sixty cents a month for one domain, and of course, DSEC is free, right, and, and allows donations. Um, so, you know. You can basically mix and match. Um, I, I'm using all four of those in different ways right now. Um, for many services, the domain registration and DNS are bundled, um, but I wanted to keep those separate. So for those who don't care about that issue, uh, my setup may seem a little too complicated, um, but again, I wanted, like if, if any one point along the way fails, I want the impact of that to be minimal and the ease of recovery to be just right there. So, um, and so finally having set up the email and DNS, I turned to migration of my do domain uh, name registrar services. Uh, Namecheap is also in that space. Um, name Silo sim you know, is similarly in that space and Dynadot uh, is another one. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, smaller providers here. I'm not really qualified to comment on all of them. Um, again, I'm not claiming that my recommendations are the last word either. Um, but I ended up on those three, uh, Namecheap. And Namecheap lets you actually separate the domain and the DNS services that they provide, even though they do provide both. Um, you can subscribe to them in a completely separable manner. Uh, name Silo, focused on domains, um, and Dynadot I found had um, some support for uh, less common domains. Uh, this one of the ones I'm using seemed on the more sort of robust end, um, whereas others are sort of easy to use. Um, 
So particular kudos to Dynadot for their support for a large range of top-level domains at low cost. Uh, I, there were a lot of recommendations of Porkbun. Porkbun um, is sort of new, kind of chic, his, hipster looking. Um, I was tempted. Um, I found their sort of snarky help um, and um, style to be at times somewhat off-putting. Um, I read about some comments about their sharing information with Chinese companies. Um, and so I went and read their privacy policy. Their privacy policy permits sharing information widely with commercial partners. Their website style seemed to prefer being cute to being informative. Um, so I, I held back. Um, I don't actually have any uh, direct problems with pork bun. If one of my other services went down, maybe I'd go back and like sign up for something. They're not expensive. Um, but those were the reasons that I, I don't have an account on pork bun at the moment. So, you know, I thought this, um, process was going to be difficult. I had feared that transition, but it turns out that swapping registrars is the simplest thing of all. It's not nearly as tricky as fussing around with your DNS records. So in conclusion, I would encourage any internet user to dive in and take control of these issues for yourself, rather than relying on any easy or bundled services that ultimately deprive you of freedom and leave you vulnerable to predatory business practices. The first step may seem the hardest, particularly if you are, for example, alphabet or meta dependent, but it is the path of freedom. So uh, if I'm able to write more blog posts on my recent experiences, I, I think those themes are only reinforced by what I've been thinking lately. Um, if you've made it this far, again, I thank you for your attention. Um, if this kind of post frustrates you, uh, it's not a change on my general approach. There will be the usual instructional videos coming as well in the upcoming months. Um, but thank you again. And